Northwoods, great to, uh, great to see you on this Sunday. Hope you're all doing well. And I just want to piggyback off of what Kurt mentioned there in announcements about baptism week coming up, baptism Sunday coming up in two weeks. I hope you'll be thinking about that, praying about, praying about that if that's a step you haven't taken yet. And trust me, the water feels great. I actually had to go for a swim just a couple weeks ago in there. Took my daughters out to do a remote controlled boat on the water. And I may or may not have tried to test the limits of the wireless capabilities. And uh, let's just say it, it went a little beyond its capabilities. And so I had to go out and get it because it was sinking. And so I've been in the water and it feels good. So again, be thinking about that. If you have not been baptized, that's your next step in your walk with Jesus. And it's gonna be a party on that Sunday. You know, my son Aaron is coming up on two years old here in October, and like life with any young child, there have been some sleepless nights. Nights where you're, you know, woken in the middle of the night, 2 a.m., to the sound of a crying child. Parents with young children, you, you understand the struggle. Now, most of the time, my beautiful wife, Michaela, will graciously go tend to him, but, you know, I'm, I'm happy to help from time to time, or at least I try and act like it. Um, so sometimes, you know, I go into his room, I'm like, dude, just quit crying. I can't handle it. I go in there, and so sometimes I'll take him out, hold him. But a while back, I realized that I didn't even have to take him out of his crib to get him to stop crying. I could literally just walk in the room and say, Aaron, lay down, and then go sit in the recliner in the corner, and he would lay down and go back to sleep. And I realized, you know, there, there's something about just knowing someone else is in the room with you. There's something about knowing dad is in the room that calms him, gives him peace, and puts him to sleep. And isn't it true that sometimes in the midst of our dark nights, whatever our night might entail, just knowing that you're not alone, knowing that your father, your heavenly father, is with you can make all the difference. You know, we can walk through a lot in this life if we know we're not alone and that the night won't last forever. And that's exactly who our God is. In fact, one of the names uh, that we're gonna look at today corresponds directly with the reality that he is always with us. And so as we close out this series today, we're gonna look at the last redemptive name of God found in the scriptures, which is the name Jehovah Shammah and means the Lord is there. The Lord is there. And that name Jehovah Shammah is found in the very last verse of the book of Ezekiel. Now, a little bit of background. Ezekiel was a priest, and he was taken into exile by the Babylonians with a group of Israelites. And amid the exile, God commissions Ezekiel as a prophet to warn the Israelites that there will be another attack and Jerusalem and the temple will be destroyed. And so much of the book, if you read through Ezekiel, is about God using Ezekiel to pronounce judgment on Israel, the surrounding nations, and Jerusalem. And sometimes, I mean, these judgments are, are pronounced through what we would call sign acts that Ezekiel Performs And some of them are just odd. Like, I'm glad I, I, I wasn't Ezekiel. One of them was lay on your side for 390 days. I can't even lay on my side for like an hour at night when I'm sleeping. But lay on your side for 390 days and then cook your food using feces as the fuel. Who said the Bible was boring? But the book ends with a hopeful conclusion, mainly the fact that God will not abandon his people. He will not leave them in ruin. So even after, as we go on, even after the temple has been destroyed, Ezekiel receives a vision of a new temple in a city that will be someday be rebuilt and restored. And the book closes by saying, and the name of that city from that time on, again, the defining characteristic of that city is the Lord is there. That's the name Jehovah Shammah. And it reminds us that the Lord will never leave us nor forsake us. He will never abandon us. He is with us as we walk through, even 
the darkest nights. And some of us here today need to be reminded that God has not abandoned you. He's with you. He's with you in the midst of whatever you might be walking through. I know it might not feel like it, but sometimes I found this to be true in my own life. You have to bring your feelings in line with the truth and let the truth lead your feelings. Listen to how the psalmist said it in Psalm 77. He said, will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in his anger withheld compassion? He's struggling, saying, God, where are you? But look at the shift that happens two verses later in in verse 11. He says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on your mighty deeds. Do you see the shift? I feel like God has abandoned me. God, where are you? But even though I feel as if he has, even though I feel this way, I'm going to choose to remember and reflect on the truth. God has always been there for me, and he always will be. God is Jehovah Shammah. He is present. He is there. He is with you. And I've been praying this week that you would sense God's nearness, the nearness of his presence in a new way this week. So that's kind of the name in a nutshell, Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is there. But I want to shift gears here and look at this name from a little bit different angle. And with the rest of our time, I want to talk about how we become individuals whose lives cause people to say of us, the Lord is there. Have you ever met someone who claimed to be a follower of Jesus, but their life, by their life, you could not tell? In other words, you couldn't look at them and say, oh yeah, the the Lord lives there. You might look at them and say, well, you say you're a follower of Jesus, but I'm really questioning whether or not the Lord lives there. It's like when when someone sends you an email and there's supposed to be an attachment, they say, hey, attached is this report, and and you get there and there's no attachment. You're like, isn't there supposed to be something else that goes along with this? Right, you forgot something. And so I wanna talk about how we become a people who when other people look at us, when other people look at our church, and this church made up of people, they say, you know what, the Lord is there. Because you see, in Ezekiel's time, the presence of God dwelt in the temple. And because of Israel's wickedness and lack of honor for the presence of God, in chapter 10 of Ezekiel, he sees a vision of God's glory departing from the temple. Leaving. Now I want you to get the parallel here. here. Today we are the temple, each of us. Our body is the temple that houses the presence of God. And thank God his presence does not leave us when we sin. But the truth is that just like the Israelites, we through our lifestyles and beliefs can create an environment where the Holy Spirit is unwelcome and restrict the flow of his empowerment, guidance, and goodness in our life. And so I wanna look at kind of what led up to, what what was happening that caused the presence to depart? Because we know that the stories of the Old Testament, the Bible says in the New Testament, were written for our learning. That we might say, oh man, look look at what happened here. I wanna make sure that that I don't fall into that. I wanna make sure that I'm trusting God, that I'm not, just not, I'm not taking sin lightly. So again, how do we create an environment that is welcoming to God's presence and ultimately leads others to say of us, the Lord is there? How do we get there? Well, key number one is this. Respond to his promptings immediately. Respond to the Lord's promptings immediately. You know, the Lord speaking to Ezekiel says this. In Ezekiel 3 and verse 7, he said, but the people of Israel are not willing to listen to you. They're not going to listen to you because they're not willing to listen to me. For all the Israelites are hardened and obstinate. They weren't willing to listen. This implies that God had been speaking, but they weren't willing to listen 
or respond to what the Lord had been speaking. See, the issue isn't whether God had been speaking, he had, but whether they were listening and responding immediately. And it's it's the same with us. The issue isn't whether God is speaking to us, God is speaking to us. The issue is always, are, are we listening and are we immediately responding to what he says? You know, researchers tell us that there is such a thing as negative filtering, where we can filter out the things we don't wanna hear. You know, when my wife and I moved back to Illinois from Chattanooga about, where was that, somewhere around 10, 11 years ago now, we lived in a farmhouse in St. Augustine, Illinois. And if you've ever been to St. Augustine, there's literally like nothing there. There's just a post office. And I think there's a restaurant that falls inside the little town limits there. Um, But that's all there is. There ain't a whole lot there. But when we were in this farmhouse, we were renting this farmhouse, one of the the main things about this farmhouse that you you just couldn't, you just, you saw it as soon as you rolled up, is there was a big railroad that went right through the front yard. Yeah, and so trains would come ripping through there at all hours of the day and night. And when trains would come, literally, I mean, the house would start shaking. I mean, you're sitting on the couch and it feels like the, the house is vibrating. Pictures on the wall, shaking. And man, it, if you were asleep, when, you, when we first moved in there, I mean, you would wake up because you'd hear it. And sometimes they'd blow that horn. I'm like, what do you, I, I wanted to run outside. <laughs> Quit blowing the horn. It's two in the morning. But see, there was a response when that train came through. And, but here's what was interesting. The more time we spent there, we didn't stay there that, that long because eventually we're like, we're moving, all right? Uh, but the more time we spent there, the more I learned to filter out the noise. And eventually I got to a place where I wouldn't even really notice the train anymore. I could just be going about my day. I'd begin to sleep through it. I, you know, I, I'd be going about my day and I'd be like, wait a minute, did the train just come through? I, I must have just missed that. You get to a place where you kind of filter it out. That's called negative filtering. And when I moved into the house, the noise of the train was annoyingly loud. But over time, I learned to ignore it. And eventually, it was as if I stopped hearing it. If we're not careful, we can do the same thing to the Lord's promptings because the more we choose not to respond to his promptings, the more we desensitize ourselves to his voice and filter him out. And eventually, we get to a place where we can cease to hear him. So if the Lord places a person on your heart, don't ignore it. Go, call them, pray for them, write a letter, do whatever action you sense is best, but respond. If the Lord illuminates a scripture to your mind, the Lord, you know, one one of the scriptures that the Lord seems to bring back to me time and time again, I'm still learning in this area, Don't exasperate your children, meaning don't expect more of them than you expect of yourself. Also admit when you're wrong. If the Lord puts that on your heart, respond. Go to your child and say, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? Respond. If you sense the Lord calling you to fast and to pray, don't ignore it. Respond to his promptings. So question, are you responding to the promptings that the Lord is giving you? Are you responding? And remember, delayed obedience is disobedience. Respond immediately. So we're talking about creating an environment that is welcoming to God's presence and ultimately leads others to say of us, the Lord is there. So we do that by responding to his promptings immediately. Let me give you key number two. Trust in his power fully. Trust in his power fully. If you look back to the book of Ezekiel, you find that part of what preceded his presence departing the temple is that the Israelites were no longer dependent and trusting in God's power. They were turning to false gods and worshiping idols. In in Ezekiel 8, Ezekiel sees a vision of the temple and the detestable things happening in it. There's idol worship, Animal worship, nature worship, they're bowing down to the sun. 
And look at what the elders of Israel are recorded as saying in chapter 8 and verse 12. It says, they say, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. Now, could this be justification for their worship? Sure. But I think there's also an element of them no longer trusting in God's power to deliver them and rescue them from the calamity that has come upon them. So they turn to other gods. They turn to the gods of the surrounding nations. There's no longer a dependence and trust in God's power. Now, I think most of us would say, you know, in this area, you know, trust God, you know, trust his power fully. You know, I'm good in this area, right? I, I trust the Lord. You know, we, we live in a nation. You know, our motto is in God we trust. And you might be. But I have found that sometimes it's hard to really evaluate yourself in this area. And so over time, as I've done a lot of reflection, I've learned that there, there are certain signs that accompany my life when I'm not trusting as I should be, and I'm not trusting fully in the Lord. And so let me give you a few of these signs, and you just, these were what's true I found in my life. You, you just, maybe you might realize there's some of these in your life as well. So here's sign number one. This is a sign that comes to my life and makes me aware I'm not trusting in the Lord fully. Sign number one is I worry. Worry consumes me when I'm not trusting the Lord. And anxiousness is constant. It's like there's this anxiety just simmering below the surface constantly. If you're worried more often than not, it means your level of trust in the Lord might be lacking. You know, I, I saw a pastor who's releasing a book, and I thought it was a great title. The title of his book is, I Worry About Everything Because I Pray About Nothing. All right? When we're worrying, it might be a sign that we're not trusting. We need to go to the Lord in prayer. So sign number one that indicates I might not be trusting is I worry. Sign number two, I can't sleep. When I'm not trusting the Lord, I lie awake at night mulling over a million solutions in my mind. And sometimes I have to say aloud before I go to bed, I choose to leave this issue in your hands, Lord. I choose to leave it in your hands and I choose to fix my mind on your goodness and your love and your power. So if, if you're like me and there's times where you struggle to sleep, it, I found that it helps to meditate on God's word before you go to bed. Make it a practice. Because you know what? You can't just stop thinking about something. If I say, hey, stop thinking about that. That's kind of hard to do. You have to replace what you're thinking about. You replace the thought. And so one of the ways we replace it is, you know what? Instead of thinking about all the things, what am I going to do this, this? No, hold up. I'm going to lay that at God's feet. And I'm going to replace what I've been thinking about with God's word. I'm going to meditate on his goodness, his power, his love for me. And I'm going to let that be what dominates my mind as I lay down to sleep. So I worry when I'm not trusting. I, I can't sleep when I'm not trusting. Another one I found in my life is I get negative really quick. Get negative. Anybody else here? Like it, it just, things just start snowballing and it's like everything is glass half empty. So I get negative. Another thing I found in my life, sign number four, is I cut my quiet time short. You ever get to that place where you got so much on your plate that you're trying to handle that you say, well, I can't really afford to spend time with the Lord this morning because I got so much I got to get done. I, I can't afford to take time and do this. So I'll move this off later, but you know what? I, I, I got to get to what I got, I got going got too many problems to solve. I need all the time I have. That attitude is indicative of trusting in yourself. God, it used to be, and the Lord is teaching me in this area, it used to be that when I got overwhelmed with the amount of stuff on my plate, I would say, I can't afford to spend time with the Lord today. But the Lord is teaching me, and I'm learning to say, I got so much to get done today I can't afford not to spend time with the Lord. Because when I spend time with the Lord in prayer, things begin to happen that I can't do in my own power. Don't cut your quiet time short. So when I'm not trusting, I worry, I can't sleep, I get negative, I cut my quiet time short. 
Another sign I found that's evident in my life is I get short with people really quick. When I'm struggling to trust the Lord and trying to carry the weight of life myself, I've found I'm easily angered by people, drivers especially. <laughs> and it, it even happens with my family and my children. So things that would not typically be a big deal make me want to explode. You know, my youngest daughter, Joanna, she just tends to move at a little bit slower pace than everyone. So we're getting out of the car. It's like, Joanna, why does it take you two seconds longer than it needs to to get out of the car? Get out! Kayla's like, John, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, got some, I got some issues I need to deal with. <laughs> but listen, when I get there, it's a pretty clear sign, you know what, that I got too much going on up here that I'm trying to solve. And I'm stressed out about it, and it's, you know what, I need to... I need to leave this with the Lord. And I found another helpful thing for me is when I leave church, when I leave my office, I literally sometimes as I walk across, across the threshold of the door, I have to say, Lord, I leave all the things that I, I wish were done, I wish could be different, I leave it here with you. Can't take this home with me. Because if I do, I'm gonna end up exploding on somebody at times because there's just too much going on. So you ever get short with people? That might be a sign that you need to trust the Lord more. So do you struggle with any of those? Are any of those signs present in your life? It might signify that you have room to grow in your trust. And I feel so strongly about this because the Lord has been teaching me this, that trust really comes out of a deep relationship with the Lord. Trust doesn't come out of just studying more about the Lord. It comes out of intimacy with the Lord. It's a process. And so if you're not growing in your relationship with the Lord, you're probably not gonna be growing in your level of trust with him. Because the more you get to know him, the more you learn this, I can trust him with my life. He's trustworthy, he's faithful. Cast all of your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So if we're gonna be a church made up of people who when others see us, they say, you know what, the Lord lives there. That means we're responding to his promptings immediately. And we're trusting in his power fully. And then here's key number three. It's honor his presence always. Honor his presence always. See, the Israelites began to dishonor the presence of God by conforming to the standards of the cultures surrounding them. It says in Ezekiel chapter 11 and verse 12, and you will know that I am the Lord, for you have not followed my decrees or kept my laws, but have conformed to the standards of the nations around you. And in conforming, they dishonored the presence of God instead of honoring him. And you know, the New Testament gives us a picture of what it looks like to honor the presence of God living inside of us. Paul said this in Ephesians, he said, and do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Don't dishonor the presence of God by the way you live. And so again, the question becomes, okay, well, if, if we're told not to do that, how do we honor him with how we live? You know, a few weeks back, Pastor Larry Stockstill, we've had him here before. You've heard me talk about him. He's been a tremendous help in my life, been really a mentor from afar to me. He recently talked about the difference between eyeballing something versus putting a level on it, and it really stuck with me. You know, growing up, I wasn't versed in the things of tools and handy people. You've heard me talk about this before, you know, the stories of trying to find a stud in the wall by just drilling holes in it until I find the stud. You know, but I've really grown to appreciate, one of the tools I've grown to appreciate is a level. And uh, I, I really appreciate this tool. And for most of my life, I was the guy who eyeballed everything. 
And I have a pretty particular wife, so when I hang things, she, if, I, if it's not straight, she'll come in and she'll usually notice. And so I've learned to, you know, a level is my friend. Uh, but I found that when you eyeball things instead of using a level, you tend to end up a bubble off. <laughs> For example, you know, I have several stories to share with you, but a few years back, my brother, uh, this was during uh, 2020, I think, my brother came over and I was going to make a kind of a really simple swing set in the backyard for our two girls at the time. And so he came over, us at our previous house, and uh, nothing fancy, literally just, you know, some posts, cross beam from which two swings could hang. I can handle that. And so I'm going to show you two pictures that Nathan took. Don't show them yet. Na now listen, Nathan took them before I was done, okay? Uh, but it really kind of exemplifies the difference between eyeballing something and using a level. Okay, so here, here's the first picture. I want you to look at the cross beam there. It, Nathan put right underneath it, nice and straight. You can see it's a little off, right? I'm not done yet, though, okay? He took the picture before I was done. That's a picture of eyeballing it. A little bit off. Now, show the next picture, okay? That's when you put the level on it. We got it straight now, okay? You see the difference between eyeballing it and putting a level on it. The first would be an example of what happens when we eyeball it. The second would be described as what happens when we level it. When you eyeball things, you tend to end up a few bubbles off. So if we're going to honor God with our life, we have to put the level of his word up against our life. We don't just rely on our own judgment and say, hmm, Ah, it feels good. Yeah, I'm good with that. We don't rely on our own judgment. If we do, we can get off track pretty quick. So what places do we need to put the level on? Well, Paul goes on to name a few. He continues in Ephesians 4. And we would say, he, he says here, put the level on your relationships. He says in Ephesians 4, verses 31 to 32, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, each other, key phrase there, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. So Paul uses the term each other, and this verse we just talked about comes right after he says, don't uh, bring sorrow to the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, these things, these bring sorrow. These dishonor the presence of God living in you. So he's talking here about our relationships with one another. And here's the key to our relationships, forgiveness. I've often found that when I'm harboring bitterness towards someone, it's because I haven't forgiven them. When I feel anger towards someone or find myself speaking ill of them, wanting to slander them, it's usually because I haven't forgiven them. And recognize, forgiveness is a choice, not a feeling. If you wait until you feel like it, you probably never will forgive. So we don't walk around and say, well, you know, Brother Fred over there, this dear brother, he really hurt me, and uh, it's what he did is just unforgivable. I will never be able to forgive him. Well, I guess you can say that, but I want to encourage you, put the level on that relationship. Does the word say to cling to bitterness or does it say to get rid of it? Put the level on it. It says get rid of bitterness. Choose to forgive. I know, I know, that, I know there's things people do that hurt us immensely. But God forgave us and he said just as Christ forgave you, you forgive other people. Put the level on your relationships. Forgive. So put the level on relationships. Put the level on your walk. He goes on to say, Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do. Everything you do, not just some things, everything. Because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. So he calls us, he says, imitate God because you are his dear children. He calls us dear children. What do children do? They imitate and I was out for my walk. Uh, I was out for a walk with my family not long ago. And I spit. And my son Aaron, I look over and all of a sudden he goes, 
right? Imitates, that's what he does, following dad's example. In our walk, we're to imitate Jesus' example, not the cultural norms. The culture eyeballs things. We put a level on things. Is this how Jesus would live? So put the level on your walk. And then Paul goes on to say, basically, put the level on your sexuality. Again, we're talking about you want to honor the Holy Spirit, this presence of God. Put the level on your sexuality. He goes on to say in verse 3 of chapter 5, let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. So he uses sexual immorality and impurity, those two words, which when you look at those two words in the language in which the New Testament was written, they cover the full scope of every kind of sexual sin, meaning all sex that falls outside of its God-ordained context of a marriage relationship involving a man and a woman. And he even includes greed, which in this context is coveting someone else's body, lusting after them. You know, it grieves my heart to see many Christians and even churches today beginning to conform to the culture regarding sexuality. In other words, we've become content to eyeball sexuality. We're using our own judgment as our point of reference. Northwoods, let's be a community of believers who say, no, we're not going to eyeball sexuality. We're going to put the level on it. What does God's word say? His word says such sins have no place among God's people. No place. Now some of you younger ones listening today, heading off to college here soon. Some of you are in college. When you get there, you're going to find that casual hookups and one-night stands are common. But here's what I want you to remember. Just because something is common doesn't mean it's normal. Just because something is common doesn't mean it's normal. Don't start eyeballing it. Put the level on it. Let's talk about pornography. Paul talked about greed, basically coveting and lusting after someone else's body. I was just listening to someone the other day who said, you know what, pornography, as long as it's occasional and not every day, it's okay and it's quite normal. It's fine as long as it's not too much. That's called eyeballing it. Put the level on it. This word says flee sexual immorality. It doesn't say dabble in it. It doesn't say it's okay to foster imaginations, to think about what it would be like to be with someone else. Married couples in here, again, I, want to, I, want to, I just want to remind you, adultery always starts at the level of imagination. I've heard, heard the quote before, and it's always stuck with me. Before the devil gets you in bed, he gets in your head. Don't, don't start imagining what it would be like to be with someone else. You give, you give your mind, your thoughts to the Lord. Let's not eyeball this stuff. Let's put a level on it. Church, we cannot be afraid. Stan, listen, if we, if we put the level on things, you understand, we will be vilified for it. You just understand, that comes with the territory. But stay the course. Let's put the level on things. We'll do it in a gracious way, a loving way. Let's put the level on things. Don't, don't be afraid to defend a traditional biblical view of marriage. Don't, don't be ashamed to have a sane understanding of gender and sexuality. Put the level on things and stay the course. Because in doing so, we will honor the presence of God. I want to be a church where people look at us, they say, the Lord is there. Now listen, as we're talking about putting the level on our sexuality, listen, I understand this is a legitimate struggle. And if it's a legitimate struggle, that's one thing. But don't let it turn into justification. Because the Lord can set you free. Do the work. Next month, we're starting another round of Pure Desire 101. It's a course that will help anyone journey towards sexual integrity, purity, and health. This is a class, not just for some people. We all can use it. So again, let's continue to be that church made up of people who don't settle for eyeballing things, 
we put the level on it. And in doing so, we will honor the presence of God. So when we respond to his promptings immediately, trust in his power continually, and honor his presence always, we will create an environment. You will create an environment in your life that is welcoming to the presence of God, and people will notice something different about you, and there will be people who say, the Lord is there. The Lord is there. That's the people we should long to be. And by the Holy Spirit's empowerment, we can. So as we close this morning, let's, let's close. We're gonna close our time together around the Lord's table. So if you have your elements with you, you can take those out. Those of you watching online, grab whatever you have around the home there, and we'll partake together. But before we partake, you know, the Bible says that we ought to examine ourselves before we come to the table. And so what I, I just want this to be a moment of reflection between you and the Lord. And before we partake this morning, I just, I want to lead you even just through those three keys we talked about. So just get in that place where it's you and the Lord. And I just want you to ask the Lord a couple questions this morning. Again, we're, this is examination, examining our heart before the Lord. Start by asking him, Holy Spirit, is there any place where I haven't been responding to your promptings? Is there any place where I have not been responding to your promptings? You can go on and ask, Holy Spirit, is there any place where I haven't been trusting in your power fully? Any place in my life where I have not been trusting you? And just let him know again, Lord, I, Holy Spirit, I trust you. Lord, I trust you. You're good, Lord. I trust you. I trust you. And then ask him, is there, is there any place in my life where I am not honoring your presence? Holy Spirit, put the level on my life. Is there any place where I'm out of alignment? If the Lord reveals anything, you just give that to the Lord. Say, Lord, I repent of not responding. I repent of trying to trust in my own power or turning to anything other than you, placing my trust in it. I repent of any place that my life is out of alignment and I ask you for your forgiveness and I thank you, Lord, that your blood washes me clean. Empower me, Holy Spirit, to be someone who lives a life that it can be said of me, the Lord lives there. And when we come to the table, we've been talking about the seven redemptive names of God. As we close this series, I just want you to think about as we come to the table, all that came to us through the cross. The Lord is Jehovah Jireh. Provision came through the cross. He's Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. Healing came through the cross. He's Jehovah Nissi, our victory. Victory came through the cross. He's Jehovah Shalom. Peace with God came through the cross. He's Jehovah Roy. He's our shepherd. He's the good shepherd who laid down his life for us. He's Jehovah Sid Kenyu. He's our righteousness. It says that on the cross, our sin was placed on Jesus. And his righteousness was placed on us. He is our righteousness. And he is Jehovah Shammah. He is the Lord who is always there. He has brought us near by the blood of Christ. And so let's take that top layer off. Take the bread. Just thank him for everything that came through the cross. All the blessings that came through the cross. And just say, Jesus, I receive in myself everything you intended through the cross. The Bible says that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body broken for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. Thank you, Jesus. And then it says that after supper, he took the cup. And he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank him again for his blood. Thank you, Lord, that your blood washes us, cleanses us. Thank you that there's power in the blood. Let's partake together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, church, if you would, let's stand. I want to pray for you as we close. Lord, we bless your name in this place. We thank you for how you have revealed yourself to us through your names in the Bible. Lord, I thank you that you are the God who is there. I pray we would be reminded in a tangible way today that you are with us always. And I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would empower us to be a people who welcome your presence and honor you in all that we do. Thank you for that, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, empower us to live for you. We give you all the praise, all the honor, all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, church. Thanks so much for being here. Those of you watching online, great to have you with us. We'll hope to see you back next week. And if you need prayer for anything, you can come down front. We'll have a prayer team here. Those of you watching online, you can ask for prayer online as well. Have a great week.